एवरीवन वेलकम टू द चार वर्क पॉडकास्ट दिस इज योर होस्ट कुशल मेहरा ऑल राइट माय गेस्ट टुडे इज जूलिया गलेफ जूलिया इज द होस्ट ऑफ द पॉपुलर पॉडकास्ट रैशनली स्पीकिंग शी इज इंटरव्यूड मेनी थिंकर्स सच एज टाइलर खान शॉन कैरल Phil Tetlock and Neil deGrasse Tyson she is an advisor to OpenAI Works with the Open Philanthropy Project and she has co-founded the Center for Applied Rationality uh, her 2016 TED Talk Why You Think You're Right Even If You're Wrong has been viewed over 4 million times but today we are here to talk about Julia's book The Scout Mindset Why Some People See Things Clearly and Others Don't Julia thanks for coming on the podcast Kushal, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. So, Julia, the, uh, we have a, a little bit of a tradition here in the Charvak podcast where every time I uh, invite a guest, I have a rule. I want to first start by asking them why did they choose to write this book on this particular subject. Yeah, I was motivated to write the Scout Mindset because of a disconnect that I kept increasingly seeing in the discourse on rationality and reasoning and. uh just all the conversations people have been having over the last 10 15 years uh in books and articles and online about how to think better um and the disconnect was basically that the bulk of the of the conversation on this subject seemed to be about increasing our our knowledge basically um and increasing people's knowledge of cognitive biases and logical fallacies um basically trying to make us smarter uh as a way of making us you know better at thinking and i'm not saying that's not important but it it increasingly seemed to me that there was a a, a separate underappreciated pillar of good reasoning that was being mostly ignored and that was about the motivation that guides our thinking um so you know are you motivated to use your intelligence and your knowledge of biases and fallacies etc are you motivated to use that to examine your own thinking and notice you know flaws in your reasoning or blind spots you might have missed or are you motivated to use that knowledge and your you know cleverness etc to prove other people wrong to you know uh reinforce all the things you wanted to believe anyway uh and i'm sure your listeners are familiar with this archetype in other people if not in themselves uh of the person who you know has memorized all of the cognitive biases and fallacies um list on wikipedia and just uses that as like a cudgel with which to beat mm-hmm. their opponents over the head <laughs> and uh and never you know says oh ha huh, i was wrong about that they they only use their knowledge to you know argue with people and prove other people wrong uh and so th- this this kind of missing factor in the conversation uh, of motivation seemed really important to me um both in the research that i'd done in cognitive science and also just in my experience of having taught classes and observed myself and observed other people uh and so the scout mindset was kind of my attempt to to close that gap and focus more people's attention on uh getting our motivations in order uh and and motivating ourselves to try to want to see things as clearly as possible including our own blind spots and you know things that we might have been wrong about and not just in proving other people wrong Awesome so let's let's unpack this a little so in, obviously in the book you also talk about motivated reasoning now mm-hmm. obviously when we are talking uh, as they say everybody likes to think they are very rational that that includes that, that includes all of us right it's not something that is unique to one one set of people obviously the the degrees might vary but mm-hmm. but let's first start with motivated reasoning itself so could you tell us a little bit about that and what are the possible pitfalls or what are the signs where, where do i know where i'm maybe getting into that trap yeah so motivated reasoning is uh is short for directionally motivated reasoning um which is a a term in cognitive science for reasoning that is mostly unconsciously aimed at getting to a particular conclusion um like a particular predetermined conclusion that you already believe or already wanted to believe and so as you're evaluating evidence or considering arguments um you're not really trying to figure out what's true you're you're just trying to find an excuse to accept what you always wanted to accept uh and my favorite kind of concise summary for how motivated reasoning tends to work comes from a psychologist named Tom Gilovich and he said that uh with motivated reasoning when you're evaluating an argument that you want to accept you look at it through the lens of 
can I accept this? So you're searching for any justification to accept it. Whereas if you're looking at an argument that you don't want to accept, you instead look at it through the lens of must I accept this? So you're reaching for any justification to dismiss it or, uh, you know, or, or rebut it. And so, you know, you feel like when, when you're engaging in motivated reasoning, you feel like you're being clever and, and, you know, skeptical and a good critical thinker. And you are, it, it's just that you're applying a very asymmetric standard of how critical you want to be, depending on whether you want to accept a particular argument or not. Um, and yes, as you alluded to, motivated reasoning is, it's universal, it's ubiquitous, it's just kind of baked into how the human brain seems to work. Um, and and it can be really hard to notice yourself engaging in it. Uh, like, like, you probably have noticed other people doing this. Um, and maybe... Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, pretty self-aware and introspective, you can you can notice that. Oh yeah, in the past I have engaged in motivated reasoning. Like maybe you can look back at, uh, at say a a past relationship where you kind of, you know, were aware of a bunch of red flags early on, but you really wanted it to work, so you found excuses to dismiss the red flags, um, or you know, maybe with with some distance from some mistake that you made, you can see that, oh yeah, I, I was like making excuses for myself. And uh, you know, at the time I I I was engaging in motivated reasoning. So you can kind of see it in the past sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. but it's especially hard to notice yourself engaging in motivated reasoning in the moment. Like you're reasoning about something right now. Can you notice like, oh, I'm engaging in motivated reasoning about this particular thing? That's really the tricky part. Um, and that's uh, I, I think that's much rarer. And so I have uh, like one of the focuses of the book is just making it easier for people to have more self-awareness and, you know, notice their brain doing this thing, which is usually invisible to them. So uh, one of the kind of classes of technique that I suggest is mm -hmm. called a thought experiment. Um, mm -hmm. And a, a simple example of a thought experiment to, motivated, no, to notice motivated reasoning is a political one. So uh, if you suppose that you see a politician um, on your side doing something that he's getting a lot of flack for, uh, like he, he's getting pilloried in the press for corruption or whatever, and you think to yourself, like, oh, come on, this really isn't a big deal. People are making too much of a thing of this. Um, I don't think it was that bad. Well, a thought experiment you can do to test whether you're engaging in motivated reasoning is to imagine that a politician on the other side had done the exact same thing. So, you know, someone from the party that you despise and think is terrible, suppose they'd done the exact same thing, what would your reaction be in that case? And a lot of the time, I think if you're being honest, the answer is, huh, actually, if someone else from the other side did that, I would be calling for his head. You know, I'd be, I, I would feel like this was a, you know, impeachment worthy or resign worthy offense. Absolutely. Um, and it, it really, it was a terrible sign about his ability to govern well or honestly. And in fact, it's really a sign of the corruption of the entire party that someone from that party did this. And and so just, just being able to notice the stark difference in how you would react or like how you would evaluate a particular situation or someone's action, noticing a stark difference uh, when, when all you're changing is whether they're on your side or the other side, that can be a really revealing way to notice your brain doing this kind of invisible motivated reasoning thing in the background. Um, and you know, you notice that thought experiments like this don't, they don't tell you how you should react. Like they're not telling you that your reaction should be, uh, to condemn or should be to not condemn. It's just pointing out an asymmetry that you're reacting differently depending on your motivations. Um, so that, that's just one example. You can use thought experiments in your personal life. Like, you know, with the case of the relationship example I mentioned, where we, you know, tend to find excuses to dismiss red flags if we really want something to work out. A thought experiment mm -hmm. there might be, suppose that someone, you know, a friend of mine was in this relationship with these potential red flags and she, you know, I was observing her situation. Um, what would I think she should do? Like, would I be optimistic about the relationship working out or not? Uh, and again, mm -hmm. you might notice a big asymmetry where, you know, if it was in someone else's life, you would feel like, oh, no, this is a terrible idea. You need to get out of this relationship. Whereas when it's in your life, you feel really drawn to make, you know, justifications and rationalizations to keep going. Um, and again, it doesn't tell you what the right answer is. It just is a way of highlighting that your judgment is different depending on your motivations.
Oh, absolutely. You know, one line in the beginning of your book, actually, and, and I want to read it out for the listeners and the viewers of this podcast, is that you, know, you say knowing that you should test your assumptions doesn't automatically improve your judgment right. any more than knowing you should exercise automatically improves your health. Now, this is such a simple yet a profound line that when I read it, I clearly remember that this means we're not out of the woods yet. I could be, <laughs> uh, you know, I could be someone who says that, look, I, I, I am here for the truth. But mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, when we end up saying things like, I'm a truth seeker, I just want the truth. It's just, you know, us coming up with lines to feel good about ourselves and uh -huh. at times justifying our own biases. So, so, how and, and then you know you obviously start the book by connecting it uh, to two mindsets right you call it the scout mindset and the soldier mindset right mm -hmm. so so now let's get into the soldier mindset because i know a lot of times a lot of times in life most people are are in that and i would say my uh, i'm i'm no different I, mm -hmm. I myself might be in that mode pretty much a lot of times which is the soldier mindset but i lie to myself as i clearly remember michael Shermer once in his book saying that smart people are smarter about rationalizing their bs to say um mm -hmm. if i was to say that they're just better at rationalizing their flaws by choosing selective arguments so so let's talk about this so how do we get rid of this problem then yeah, so I'll I'll just be explicit about the the scout and the soldier metaphor in my book. Um, scout, oh sorry, soldier mindset is my metaphor for motivated reasoning, for directionally motivated reasoning. Um, and I like to call it soldier mindset just because it's very similar to being like a soldier on a battlefield, uh, trying to defend your beliefs against any evidence that might threaten them, um, or you know building up a strong fortress around your beliefs by accumulating supporting evidence that, you know, it's going to be hard for other people to knock down. Um, and, and you can even see this in, in English, at least. I don't know if this is true in other languages, but in English, a lot of the language that we use to talk about reasoning and beliefs and, you know, arguments is very militaristic. We talk about, you know, shooting down uh, sub, uh, an idea or an argument or like poking mm -hmm. holes in or finding the weak points in an argument. Um, and we talk about buttressing or supporting or reinforcing our own beliefs as if they're a fortress that we want to make completely impervious to attack. Um, so directionally motivated reasoning I call soldier mindset. And then mm -hmm. the book is really about this counterpart to soldier mindset, this different way of thinking, this different motivation that I call scout mindset. Um, and the scout's role, unlike the soldier, is not to attack or defend. It's just to go out and you know, survey the terrain, survey the situation, um, and try to see what's actually there, what's actually true, as clearly and honestly as possible. And, you know, you might have preferences about what's true. Presumably, the scout would hope to learn that, you know, there's a, a bridge across the river um, in a convenient location or something like that. But above all, mm -hmm. the scout doesn't want to draw something on their map that's not actually there in reality. Like, if there's not a bridge... The scout doesn't want to draw a bridge on their map. <laughs> they, they just want Absolutely. an accurate map so that they can make better decisions. So scout mindset is basically uh, a, a metaphor for wanting to be, wanting to have an accurate map of the world, um, wanting to see things as clearly and honestly as possible, um, basically trying to be intellectually honest and objective and curious about what's actually true. So let's talk about something that, in the book, you you have a section called, Is It True? So you say, in contrast to directionally motivated reasoning, which evaluates ideas through the lenses of, can I believe it? And must I believe it? Mm -hmm. Accuracy motivated reasoning evaluates ideas through the lens of, is it true? Again, now the problem is, everybody thinks they're a truth seeker. Now, I want to take the analogy right. here of the religious mindset, Julia. Now, religion if is the oldest meme that you know that humanity has been dealing with in that sense that is in its essence right designed for truth seeking right uh, but if we look at the edifice of religion itself it is anything but truth seeking right because the religious mindset doesn't tell us is it true the religious mindset is actually the completely opposite it is about believing or 
suspending your beliefs in that sense but as we see you know the religious condition is so natural many times i i i'm trying to stay away from committing the naturalistic fallacy here but when i say natural i just say people you, you homo sapiens get so attracted to the religious condition that mm-hmm. you know even i don't know how to say it, that in the western world now with the fall of the old religion you have you know john mcwhorter with his new hypothesis where he says religion is actually coming making a comeback in in a new form mm-hmm. so so how would you say that the scout mindset deals with religion then so i i don't think religion is at all unique as as you're hitting i don't think religion is at all unique in uh in being not really about you know objective investigation of the facts uh, um with you know the the freedom to conclude whatever the facts seem to justify um i think most things in life have have some element of that certainly political beliefs um you know there's not there, there's a lot of encouragement socially to uh accept and reinforce whatever the you know good like like socially accepted good beliefs are politically um as opposed to you know questioning and dissenting etc um a lot of not necessarily political but just sort of societal cultural norms are the same you know there's not a lot of encouragement to question the way your society does something the the norms we have around how to live your life or how people of different ages or genders should behave etc um and to some extent that's understandable like it would be a little hard for society to function if everyone was you know constantly rejecting every single norm and uh and and belief about you know what is good or virtuous or you know how society should be structured um and so it makes sense to me that there's a lot of social pressure to uh you know keep believing whatever the consensus view is in your social group um so you know i agree that religion has a lot of those elements but i don't think it's unique in that way um and you know i think it's important to recognize that people two people who are both perfect scouts can still end up with very different beliefs if they start from different premises so mm-hmm. you know i i'm not religious myself i i don't think religious beliefs are true um but i know people who are religious who i think are unusually good at scout mindset and i think that they just started from very different premises than i did you know they started from a very different starting point of you know who who they knew who they respected um and what those people told them was true about the world um and you can sometimes get out of your starting point um if you are lucky and if you try really hard to question things um but even if you're trying harder than most people you still might not end up you know changing your mind about something really fundamental if you you know started from a point where that thing was reinforced as really true from the beginning I'm not sure I'm explaining this very well but you know the the general point I'm trying to make here is that you can't actually to a first approximation you can't actually tell whether someone is engaging in scout mindset or soldier mindset just by looking at what they believe you'd have to look at how they're thinking about it and whether they're you know interested in evidence against their beliefs whether they're you know open to the idea of believing something different or whether they you know always find an excuse to ignore uh even credible evidence that contradicts something they believe. Hmm. So 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 this is why I I asked you the religious question because I clearly remember in the book you you talk about in the scout mindset that you used a very specific word there. You say there is no such thing as a threat to your beliefs, right? Now now that that sounds so correct. But the point is that I was just thinking about it. There are so many moments in my own personal life that you know when my beliefs were challenged or are going to be challenged in the future the biggest emotion that you know sometimes we don't counter or encounter or we don't think about is we are actually scared of losing our beliefs mm-hmm. you know we we are scared that oh my god that means what i believed in is was wrong and it was a lie and that's why immediately because as a disbeliever myself i mean it took me back to the age of 17 and took me back to that moment where you know one fine day in my life where i just had questions about divinity and 
and i clearly remember that emotion i had in my head that oh i believe something flawed and now i could easily get over that in in a very different way but i see many people clinging on to beliefs many times and this is not specific to religion religion is just an example but even mm-hmm. with politics people just you know they kind of dilly dally around it because they say it gives me comfort so in a in a way we are we are are we comfort seekers then yeah i mean i think comfort is one of the reasons why we might be reluctant to uh question certain deeply held beliefs um another reason is the social element that if we start to question them we feel on some level like you know our friends and family and and people in our social groups are going to think worse of us if we you know start questioning our religious beliefs or or the consensus political beliefs etc um and and these are all you know very legitimate things to be worried about and i don't want to dismiss them um there's a reason that soldier mindset has it is so ubiquitous and uh, and kind of baked into the human brain. It's serving these important functions for us, like providing us with comfort, allowing us to you know feel good about ourselves and to uh, fit into our various tribes, whether that's political or religious or uh, or racial. Um, so you know, soldier mindset has these functions that it's played historically for the human species. The thing that I'm trying to push in the book, though, is to say that especially now, especially in the modern world, soldier mindset is less important and valuable than you might intuitively feel like it is. And it's it's more possible to be a true seeker, to be a scout, and to be you know happy and successful and uh, you know influential and socially accepted um, without having to just knee-jerk accept everything that uh, happens to be the consensus. Um, and so a lot of the book is just about pointing out ways that people have done this uh, point out ways that people have, you know, been happy and successful, et cetera, without necessarily having to accept every consensus view in their uh, in their society. And I think, you know, it's important to to notice the differences between the world as it is today and the world that our ancestors evolved in. Uh, and one mm-hmm. important difference is that we have a lot more choice and an opportunity now to change our lives than our ancestors did. So, you know, if today, if you're unhappy, you, to varying extents, depending on where you live and your situation, um, but, you know, usually to a large extent, you have the ability to change careers or to choose whether or not you want to get married or to have children. Um, You can choose where you want to live. You can choose which social group you want to spend your time with, et cetera. Um, If you're having health problems, you can choose which health treatments to try, like which ones seem promising enough to be worth the risk. You can choose, uh, you know, different ways of trying to be happier. If you're unhappy, you can try going to therapy or reading philosophy or moving Mm -hmm. to a sunnier country. You know, I could go on forever, but there are a lot of things that you can try to change your life um, and achieve your, your goals and your values today that just weren't an option for our ancestors. Like our ancestors lived in relatively small tribes. You couldn't just move to a different tribe if you didn't, you know, agree with or like your own tribe. You kind of had one career path, essentially, um, baked in that was really hard to change. And it was very set based on your family and your gender, et cetera. Um, you couldn't really choose whether to have children. And so the reason I'm talking about all this is that if you look at the the role of the scout, it's it's to form as accurate a map as possible of a situation or a, you know a, an issue so that you can make better decisions. Like the point of the map is to navigate the world as well as possible. It's mm-hmm. to you know make decisions about how to get where you're trying to go as effectively as possible. That's what the map is for. But if if you're in a world in which you you can't make any choices, you know, there's only one path available to you, then then the map is not very useful. And so, you know, that's the world yeah. that we evolved in. Um and so it kind of makes sense to me. This is all, you know, this is not like a proven argument, but I think it makes sense if you think about it that given that we evolved in a world in which we couldn't actually make a lot of choices to improve our lives, it makes sense that we would have evolved to, you know, not really prioritize on an instinctive level, forming an accurate map of reality. Uh, And so now, given that we have so many more opportunities to, you know, change our lives and and change our situation, I think we should Mm -hmm. consciously choose to start prioritizing an accurate map 
uh, much more than our brains intuitively want to. Um, and often this involves taking kind of a longer term view of success or happiness. Um, so like in the short term, maybe you would be better off, you know, never questioning the views that your social group has, because if you do start questioning them, then maybe, you know, people won't, uh, won't like you as much or something. Mm -hmm. But if you zoom out a little more and look in the longer term, if you do allow yourself to notice, huh, I don't actually agree with, you know, the way my social group thinks about politics or gender or whatever. If you allow yourself to notice that, then you're giving yourself a shot to change your social group over time, you know, and start meeting people who think more the way you do or, you know, are more open minded or accepting of the thing, the way you want to live your life. Um, and you, have, you know, are giving yourself a shot at truer happiness in the longer run. But in order to get there, you have to be willing to, in the short run, incur the cost of, you know, noticing and and uh, and being able to reject some of the views that are in your kind of local society. So that, that's my pitch for why I think the human brain tends to undervalue scout mindset intuitively and why mm -hmm. we would be better off, at least somewhat better off, if we shifted more in the direction of scout mindset in the long run. Yeah, obviously you talk about, uh, you know, the six overlapping categories, right? You talk about comfort, self-esteem, morale, persuasion, image, and belonging, right? Mm -hmm. These, it's the combination of the six that cause a problem. Another area that I want to talk to you about, Julia, I'm a podcaster. Now, the podcasting world, at least around the world, I think it's pretty similar around the world. It's, it's, it's come down to uh, one of the biggest reasons podcasts have become famous is that, you know, podcasters do have the relative freedom in comparison to other content creators that they can go against the grain but but you know we live in a digital world you know you're in one corner of the world i'm in another corner of the world right. we would have never thought of having a conversation about your book written somewhere else you know in india but we do now but we we are all also suffering from a unique period in our lives where you know we never used to have so many opinions to be very honest i mean i at least never did Right. But social media has kind of uh, pushed us into this over-opinionated zone, right? Now, if I was to ask you, now, you know, for young kids, because a lot of my listeners are actually in the age group of 18 to 25, and uh, I've become old, I'm 40 plus now, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, so you use this line in the book, you say the scout mindset only requires you to be able to acknowledge to yourselves that you were wrong, not to other people. Still a willingness to say I was wrong to someone else is a strong sign of a person who prices the truth over their ego. That's Can right. you think of cases in which you've done the same? Now, I, I have done it in my life, but mm -hmm. in the world of social media, Julia, the one thing that is getting disincentivized the most is actually somebody coming out and saying, hey, listen, I'm wrong because then the echo chamber, the clicks don't come the hashtags don't come, the numbers don't come. So how does a young kid on social media who is tied to the social media echo chamber actually actively seek the scout mindset on a digital platform then? Yeah, I, I think you're right that, that on average, people are rewarded for sticking to their guns and not changing their mind on average. Um, that that's that's like the most typical audience member that that's how they're going to reward and punish you. Um, but that on average hides a lot of variability. Um, and I think people tend to underestimate the s size of the population that actually does appreciate intellectual honesty. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you can be wrong all the time. Like if you're literally always saying, oh, no, I was wrong. Oh, no, I was wrong. Oh, no, I was wrong. Then people might justifiably start to think, you know, ah, why should I listen to this guy? He never gets anything right. But but that, that leaves you a lot of wiggle room with a lot of people to sometimes say, oh, you know what? Sorry, I was wrong about this. Um, I rescind the, you know, the argument that I made on last week's podcast or in my, my blog post last week. Um, I, I don't think I ended up including this in the book, but when I looked, I, I you know, before starting to write the book, I had this kind of assumption in my mind that was just the common wisdom that nobody wants to hear any uncertainty or admission of error. Uh, that was just like my assumption. And then I looked at the studies on how people react to uncertainty or admission of error. And there was so much more variability than I had expected. So in general, uh, what I found is that there's always like a... 30 to 40% subset of the population in whatever study, whether it's, you know, 
people reacting to uncertainty from scientists or like public health officials or whether it's people in a study reacting to uncertainty from, uh, you know, financial advisors or whatever. There's always a subset. It's like 30 to 40 percent of people who uh, don't want to hear uncertainty at all and say they think worse of an expert if he admits uncertainty or changes his mind. But then there's also always a, a large subset, usually larger than 40 percent of people who say, actually, that's, you know, I respect that more that they were able to admit uncertainty and I trust them more because of it. And if they claimed to be perfectly certain, then I, you know, I wouldn't believe them. And so this kind of bimodal distribution of reactions, I think, is really important to appreciate because, you know, if you're you can't appeal to everyone in the world, people mm -hmm. you know, are all different and have different expectations and uh, and you know preferences about who they're going to follow online, different tastes. And so you just have to choose which subset of the population do I want to appeal to. Um, and so you could, you know, try to appeal to the the subset that hates uncertainty and only wants you to always be 100% sure of your opinions. Or you could choose to try to appeal to the subset of the population that values uncertainty when it's warranted um, and appreciates nuance and, you know, rewards you for changing your mind, etc. And so, you know, I'm not going to claim that everyone in the world should, uh, like, that it would be in their own best interest to... Uh, talk in terms of uncertainty and nuance and change their mind publicly and so on. But I think that's true of a lot of people and they don't realize how much uh, potential they have to build up a large and a valuable audience uh, online by, you know, being intellectually honest, by being a scout, essentially. Uh, and, and, you know, as for your own, um, uh, like, in your personal life, you have a lot of ability to curate your online experience and to start following and engaging with people online who do actually reward you for uncertainty and nuance. You don't have to just follow the people who are, you know, proud soldiers. Uh, over time, you can create an online experience for yourself where you're exposed to scout mindset more and you get rewarded for scout mindset more than you do for soldier mindset. Yeah. So I guess what I was trying to say is that sometimes uh, we live in a culture where I'll give you an example. I know it's very silly, but you know what happens? It's like, Everybody loves sport, right? So mm -hmm. they make a sporting prediction. I mean, as if, you know, their lives depend on it, but people are people. Or you make an observation. Like, I'll give you a real life example. So I, when the vaccination for COVID-19 had started in India, I was extremely skeptical of the vaccine numbers in oh, India. Yeah. And I had made a prediction that, you know what? I think only 40% less than or 40 to 45% of the adult population in India would get fully vaccinated. Boy, was I wrong. Interesting. Uh, yeah, more than. Why do you 70s. think you were wrong? Or like, I, you know, what, what do you think you were? Uh, what was wrong about your process, or like, what assumptions were wrong? Well, I, I was automatically assuming that because the overall threat perception of COVID was not as high in India, so people would not mm. go ahead and take the vaccine. But then I, you know, I, I, and I remember why I was. Oh, I'm grossly wrong because now, almost ninety percent of the whole nation and. Of the adult population when we're talking about the adult population in india it's almost a billion people mm. almost 90 percent of that itself has taken a single dose and you know in the adult population i think um, more than i think 50, 60 percent has uh, been fully vaccinated and you know kudos to the indian government they've really done a great job you know and because india is so vast and we have rural coverage and and you know the healthcare workers really have to do a lot but i clearly yeah. remember being wrong and 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 in fact, I would say that, you know, it was one of those moments where I tweeted out that, oh, boy, was I wrong about this. And and I didn't feel bad about it, but but it, it sounds very stupid. But nowadays, I guess it takes courage to even admit openly in the age of social media that you're wrong. Because <laughs> Well, what was your reaction like? I'm curious. Well, when I found out, because... Then I'm I sorry, I mean, what was the reaction of your followers to you saying, boy, I was wrong? Oh, nothing. As somebody was like, uh, most people were appreciative, but then yeah. everybody who found out I was wrong went to the old tweet and started shaming me about it. I was like, you only found out it, about it because I <laughs> myself shared it. I guess those people never liked me in the first place, but it's very interesting. So, so what I came across at that little experience that I had about me being wrong about the vaccination coverage in India was that, first of all, that sometimes we censor ourselves mm -hmm. and we don't want to admit our you know, mistakes openly is that maybe we're not 
mentally prepared for you know the the shaming the social media shaming whatever that is i mean these are just you yeah. know uh, people who don't even know us first of yeah. all but but uh, at the end of the day you know like i said we were you know this is an experiment we are all part of it's an ongoing experiment you know you are part of it i am part of it the, and uh, the funny thing is that nobody signed up for it we just on you know the the train started moving all of us hopped on to the train and we we're all experimenting <laughs> with ourselves in, in some absurd way but but i just realized that that very moment when i actually admitted to being wrong i felt a huge burden of me mm-hmm. i was like it's okay i can be wrong yeah big deal i mean and and empirically like you have proven to yourself that it is okay when you're wrong like as you said many most of your followers were appreciative some people you know used it as an excuse to slam you for the previous tweet but but most people appreciated it like that that's a really valuable thing to prove to yourself you know multiple times so that you really appreciate it on a gut level that yeah no i can i can be wrong it's fine it's going to be fine like even you know me saying that to people it's going to be okay if you're wrong you're really you know overestimating the you know how unpleasant it's going to be it's not enough for me to just say it people have to experience it for themselves a few times before they will actually appreciate oh yeah this is fine <laughs> and i still i still have to remind myself of that like this is in in the class of techniques that i use and that i you know suggest to other people to make it easier to be wrong and to notice that you're wrong one one big technique that i use a lot is just i mean it's almost silly to describe it as a technique but just in that moment when i feel that twinge of worry that i might be wrong and i'm tempted to kind of push that out of my mind or like reach for excuses for why i'm right um i just try to re- remind myself like okay in the past when i've been wrong what's happened like how bad was it and and i pretty quickly remember like oh yeah i you know was wrong about that other thing and i said so online and it was fine <laughs> like most people were appreciative and just reminding myself of that can help kind of dissipate that stress and that that impulse to double down on my previous belief in order to you know save face or whatever um but you do kind of have to keep your re- reminding yourself of that because your instinct still that first instinct is usually going to be no i can't be wrong that would be terrible even though that's not actually borne out by experience um and yeah i think there's there's some human tendency to just really over focus on that small subset of the population that yeah. you know will punish you for being wrong as you were talking i was remembering um uh, a friend of mine who i think is an excellent scout her name is kelsey piper and she's a journalist at vox in their future perfect section um and mm-hmm. she had this great thread on twitter last year about what she was wrong about regarding covid Um, specifically she was saying, you know, I really, in retrospect, I think I should have sounded the alarm earlier. Like I had all the information I needed to be pretty sure that COVID was going to be a big deal and people should start taking precautions, but I didn't sound the alarm. Um, and now I'm kind of doing a retrospective to figure out why didn't I, uh, and there are a number of reasons, partly like feeling like she didn't have the, I don't know the authority as a journalist to, you know, dissent from the consensus, things like that. Um, And the response to her thread, her kind of introspective mea culpa thread was, was the vast majority was positive. People are like, Oh, it's so cool that you're really thinking about this and you're being honest. We appreciate it. But there were some people who were like, you know, see, this just shows you're incompetent as a journalist and like, no one should trust journalists because they, you know, whatever they get things wrong. And, to me, when I looked at the responses, I thought, oh, this is like overwhelmingly positive. Kelsey should feel great. But then when I talked to her later about it, she's like, oh, I felt terrible after that thread because people were so critical of me. Uh. And I was like, but they were such a sub, they were the minority. And like, you should be focusing on all the people who appreciated it. But, you know, I totally get that tendency and I do it myself. Like people are mostly, you know, uh, positive about my work, but I fixate on the small subset who are negative about it. So I think it's just, you know, this is a very common tendency, but it's it's helpful to notice that tendency and try to correct for it so that you don't let that small subset of the population, you know, have too much power over how you think and act. Yeah, I guess we're all suffering from the negativity bias. And I, I clearly remember Steven Pinker once in an interview saying, uh, telling someone that, you know, imagine getting up in the morning and watching a news and the news anchor says, what a nice day. Who's going to watch that news channel? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was right. like, yeah, 
unfortunately nobody's going to watch the news channel because the news channel needs to show you doom and gloom all the time we're all going to die kind right. of a scenario and and I mean, and yeah. and i guess that's that's exactly how social media is built and you know the moment somebody you know says something bad to you it kind of gets stuck in your head and you always obsess about it and then you care yeah and and unfortunately that's what turns you off from maybe being more open and in fact sometimes you know sharing your views on things that you feel are wrong and you just you just want to be you know you're just you could care you know you're worried about the digital mob nowadays we have digital mobs too i mean what right. a time to be alive so <laughs> Uh, yeah. but but two things th- that i wanted to specifically ask or request you to talk about is because uh-huh. these two tests are very specific that you talk about you know you talk about two things you talk about a a conformity test where you say imagine this person told me that they no longer held this view would i still hold it would mm-hmm. i feel comfortable defending it to them and the other was you you called it the selective skeptic test imagine mm-hmm. this evidence supported the other side how credible would you find it then now uh, uh, I, i mean i don't hide it i'm a political animal i have political opinions i've been you know i have I have 10 to 11 years of uh, working on and off on political issues in india too and this is something that is my observation uh, that happens the most in my view in politics where people just cannot gather or garner the courage to admit that the leader of their choice the political outfit that of their choice that votes could come up with a bad policy so i'll give you an example right mm-hmm. let's say there is a policy in india that is launched by party a uh now party a launches a social welfare scheme and if you don't vote for party a you're going to find 1000 flaws in that particular social welfare scheme all you need to do is remove the name of the party and put it out there and you like the same scheme am i right am i understanding <laughs> this is what you were explaining it in the in the two examples uh i mean yeah that that is that can be an example of a a thought experiment um you know they the, the kind of the exact thought experiment that's appropriate for a particular case will vary a lot um but that the general form yeah is to try to remove the features of the situation that might be motivating you like the fact that it's your party and then see how your reaction changes um so i guess a, an example in my own life recently of of doing something like the selective skeptic test is um i was i was reading this thread on a message board about um an organization that i co-founded you mentioned it the center for applied rationality um and people were being critical of the organization and i was thinking to myself you know they're they're being really unfair they don't know all the details like they're basing their criticisms off of you know vague impressions or rumors they don't know the inside story so they really have no right to be critical and then i stopped and i did this thought experiment of well suppose i was reading these exact same things but about a different organization how would i react and i was like oh i guess i'd be you know kind of critical <laughs> like i would think I, it wouldn't occur to me to say well i don't have all the inside information i would just be basing my impression of that organization off of what i had heard about them just like these people on this message board are um and so you know the interesting thing about that thought experiment is it doesn't it could go either way so so either it could imply that um these people are right to be critical and i was being too defensive of my organization or it could imply that i should when i'm reading something about another organization or a you know a movement or a person anything that i don't have inside information about i should be more hesitant to judge because i don't have all the facts like those are two different conclusions that i could draw from from the results of the, that thought experiment that i did um i think probably the the right answer is a mix of both um but it at the very least it was interesting to notice that my reaction would be different if i was reading that about a different organization um So you know that the thought experiment that you proposed and the thought experiment that I described are are different um but they're kind of both examples of the same general principle of trying to you know take yourself out of the situation or or you know take your own side out of the out of the issue and then see how your reaction changes. Yeah and you know another thing that I'll share with you that I do all the time with my friends who are not very well you know worse with indian politics for example is that so 
and and honestly these are the few things that i did and w- which helped me finding blind spots in my own political thinking mm-hmm. i started following politics of america and canada now people would be like why would you do that i was like hey, anyways america has a disproportionately large effect on world politics whether we like it or not so it's always yeah. good to know what's happening in america to when i started listening to both sides in america so what i would use uh, what i used to do is i would go to pod save america just listen to everything they say and uh-huh. then maybe i'll go to a ben shapiro and i'll listen to everything ben shapiro says now i have no skin in the game when it comes to let's say america right i mean i'm not a citizen of america i don't vote i don't do anything so for me as an outsider i just used to listen to both the sides and their points of view and their representation of a same subject like the same subject but it is represented such a different way i started seeing blind spots in my own thinking thanks mm. to listening to them and i started realizing oh i do this when i follow or do my political arguments in india that's what i'm yeah, doing what they are doing and and that's what helped me and then what, the second thing that i always did was whenever i have to present indian politics to someone is i play this game with them i tell them so okay you claim that you know indian politics very well because you come from a preconceived notion of your political understanding in the world so what i do is i i play this game with everyone where i remove the names of all the political outfits <laughs> all i do is i keep the policies and i uh-huh. just read the policy or the speech and i tell them now tell me is this leader right wing or is this uh-huh. leader left wing is this political outfit right wing and is this political outfit right wing, wing and they always make mistakes because they just cannot understand because indian politics is so all over the place uh-huh. and 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 and, and i funny. only realized this by actually observing the republicans and the democrats or the ndp and the conservatives and the liberals in canada it helped yeah. me so much clear my mind because like you sure, know when you're not personally invested in the result of whether justin trudeau wins or harper wins or erin o'toole wins or or trump wins or obama wins or whoever wins you could care less you start looking at it with a far more unemotional mindset uh-huh <laughs> that's great and it reminds me of a um an anecdote that i almost included in the book and i think it got cut at some stage of editing um but there was this danish group i think or maybe they were dutch um and they they went around it was like man on the street interviews and they were reading people passages from the quran um and and asking them like what do you think of this and the passages were kind of inflammatory there were things about I don't know how women should be subservient to men and I don't know how people should be stoned for whatever offense and you know people were very critical and and some of them explicitly said you know this this is a it's really clear how much more savage or barbaric Islam is compared to like Christianity and then the group revealed the trick which was that they were actually reading from the Bible <laughs> uh, not the Quran <laughs> and um and people were mostly kind of good-natured about having been fooled um but but it was pretty funny and you know again this doesn't tell you how you should feel about those passages but it does kind of reveal that like your assumption about where they're coming from definitely colors whether you you know take them seriously and take them as like a serious uh condemnation of a religion or a people or whether you are inclined to kind of dismiss them as like well that was like a product of the time not you know it doesn't really tell you much about the religion now or you know uh those weren't meant to be taken literally or whatever <laughs> like there are a lot of things people say to to dismiss passages like that in the bible um if they know that it's in the bible <laughs> and aren't led to believe that it's in the quran so, so you're essentially talking about the mental gymnastics that we indulge in right so that yeah that, yeah unconsciously that, that's a- mostly we don't it doesn't feel like we're engaging in mental gymnastics and like i speak for myself as well you know i uh well actually an example from the book of the skeptics or the selective skeptic test that i did was when i was researching like going through the the cognitive science literature for the book um i found the study that contradicted my thesis in the book basically it was saying that a uh, soldier mindset makes you successful and happy not scout mindset and so of course i was like hmm i don't know about this let me let me check their methodology section and see what i think of it and so i looked at the methods and it was not a good study like it was their methods were bad <laughs> and and i kind of you know set the study aside going like all right well now i don't need to worry about that but then i did the selective skeptic thought experiment where i asked myself suppose this exact same study with the same methodology had had 
had turned out in a way favorable to my thesis. Suppose they had found that scout mindset makes you happy and successful. What would I have done then? And I realized, oh, I would have just, you know, happily cited in, it in my book. I wouldn't have, you know, scrutinized their methodology looking for flaws, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of like a wake up call for myself to notice, gee, I need to really up my skeptical game when mm -hmm. it comes to evaluating studies that support my thesis. And I like went back through a bunch of the studies I had set aside to cite in the book and looked at their methodology sections. And a lot of them were bad too. And so I had to cut large sections of my current book draft because I didn't feel like the research that I was citing was very good at all. <laughs> but like, I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel like I was engaging in mental gymnastics at first. I just felt like I was being a good critical thinker. I was evaluating their methodology and it was bad. Like not, that was all true. It's just that I was applying a stricter standard than I would have if the study had supported me in the first place. Hmm. So, you know, you talk about a particular set of people in the book. So uh, I would request you to maybe, you know, talk about them because I think th those people would be the perfect uh, examples before we, you know, wrap up today's chat. Uh -huh. So you talk about super forecasters, right? Yeah. And uh, so, so could you tell maybe uh, us a little bit about what super forecasters are and what makes them so unique? Yeah. So uh, super forecasters are a, a group of people um, recruited by uh, a team of social scientists um, led in part by Philip Tetlock, who's a political scientist at Wharton, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he's been his whole career has been about um, studying predictions and forecasting. So like when people, uh, for example, when you know an expert on politics makes a prediction about who's going to win the election or about uh, when the Soviet Union is going to collapse or whatever, how often are they actually right? And like, which experts actually have skill at forecasting, which is something that people, you know, were not paying very much attention to before. Uh, we just sort of treated the experts, we, like we, we assumed that people who, you know, had a PhD in a subject were experts and we didn't really pay that much attention to their track record of whether they were making good predictions or not. Um, so this is something Tetlock's been interested in for a long time. And about 15 years ago, or yeah, 15 years ago, he uh, joined a tournament, a forecasting tournament led by a branch of the U.S. government. Um, and so he recruited a bunch of people to take part in this tournament and compete against professors at top universities and intelligence analysts at the CIA. Um, and the people he recruited were, they were amateurs. They weren't like intelligence analysts themselves, smart amateurs, but just amateurs. They only had, you know, Google to help them make these predictions. Um, but the the top people on Tetlock's team just blew the competition out of the water. Like they were, mm. I think, 30 percent more accurate than the CIA when they were making predictions about uh, politics wow. and economics. And I think 50 to 70 percent more accurate than the teams of professors <laughs> at top universities. Um, and so basically the competition, uh, th this Department of the U.S. government uh, ended the competition early. Like they kicked out all the other teams because they were so much worse <laughs> than Tetlock's team. <laughs> and so, so Tetlock dubbed that his, this slice of his team, the best forecasters, he called them the super forecasters. And then he wrote this book called super forecasting about what they were doing, right? Like, why were they so much more accurate, um, than everyone else, including these so-called experts? Um, and there are a number of things. A lot of them line up with what I call scout mindset, um, they tended to think in shades of gray instead of black and white. Um, so, you know, they, uh, they would kind of adjust their confidence in their theories up or down a little bit at a time as they learned new information. So maybe they were, you know, pretty confident that, uh, you know, civil war in a certain country would be over by December, but then as they read the news, they learn more about the conflict and then they become more pessimistic. So they lower their confidence, et cetera. And it's this kind of gradual adjustment process. They don't just have one kind of stock view of the world that they stick to no matter what. Um, and most importantly, I'd argue, they're very curious about what they get wrong. So mm -hmm. you know, not only were the super forecasters more accurate than everyone else, they also improved kind of rapidly over the course of the tournament, which was three years. And other people didn't improve at all. Like they're their average accuracy didn't change over the course of their participation, whereas the super forecasters got more and more accurate as time went on. Um, and the reason, I would argue, is that when the super forecasters got something wrong, like when they made a prediction confidently that turned out to be wrong, they would go back and kind of scrutinize, like, okay, what was I, what was I thinking here that led me to get this wrong? Kind of like what you were saying about um, 
about your failed prediction about the uptake of the COVID vaccine in India. Um, mm -hmm. And you were kind of thinking to yourself about, you know, well, what, what assumptions did I make that led me to get this wrong? That's the kind of thing that the super forecasters would do every time. They would kind of eagerly go back over their process and, and try to figure out, like, was there something wrong about my process? So, for example, they might they might learn general principles like, well, you know, this this question that I got wrong about, uh, you know, what the Japanese prime minister would do. I think the reason I got it wrong is that I was imagining myself in his shoes and thinking about what I would do in his situation. And that's maybe not a good way to make predictions because, you know. <laughs> the Japanese prime minister's like background and, and incentives are so different than mine. So maybe I should be careful of using that method in the future. And so they, they kind of made updates, um, not just to their view of their world, but to their view of how to make predictions about the world um, over time. And so, you know, that's, I think, an especially nice case study in why it's good to be eager to discover things you're wrong about and curious uh, about understanding why you get things wrong rather than trying to, you know, flinch away from noticing that you're wrong and downplaying even in your own mind, the extent to which you were wrong. Um, because if you allow yourself to notice it, you can get better at, you know, being more accurate in the future. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I, I just love that bit about uh, the super forecasters. I was like, well, I, I wish the world had more and more people like this. But then, you know, if if uh, maybe... So would you say cultivating the scout mindset is a slightly tougher job on average? That would be my last question. Um, yeah, I think it's tougher in some ways. It, you know, it certainly requires a little more, um, a little more work than soldier mindset because, you know, looking for your blind spots and questioning things and seeking out evidence that's more work than not doing it. <laughs> Um, and it can also, it can also require emotional effort to, to, you know, force yourself to do something that's a little bit st stressful or scary, like acknowledging you were wrong about something, um, or, or listening seriously to people who you think are, are wrong or even in dangerous or harmful ways, like people on the other side of the political aisle, that's, you know, not, not the most emotionally pleasant thing to do. So, so yeah, I think people are correct to, feel that scout mindset might be more difficult than soldier mindset in a lot of ways. Um, but I think we should also not lose sight of the ways in which scout mindset can be really emotionally rewarding. And that's part mm -hmm. of what I was trying to point out in the book, that there are these kind of big underappreciated emotional rewards of thinking like a scout. Like, for example, the freedom, the feeling of kind of lightness and and liberation that comes from feeling like you're allowed to conclude whatever you, you know, whatever the facts lead you to. Um, you don't, mm -hmm. like when you're thinking about something, about politics or religion or whatever, you know, you don't have that pressure hanging over you that you have to get a certain answer or else your world will come crumbling down or you'll be a bad person or whatever. No, you can just, you know, follow the facts wherever they lead and whatever answer you get, that's fine. It's not, you know, some reflection on you as a person. Um, I find that really really liberating, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. And I also, you know, as a corollary, kind of enjoy the feeling that I, you know, if I'm being intellectually honest, then when I'm in an interview or when I'm just talking to someone online or in person, I don't have to defend any particular point of view. I'm totally free to say like, yeah, you know, I know I said that in the past, but, you know, my views have changed since then. And that's fine. <laughs> like, you know, mm. I at least found it pretty stressful uh, in those instances in my life when I felt like I had to defend a particular view that maybe, you know, I didn't 100% believe. Um, it's unpleasant. <laughs> like, it's it's stressful to feel like I might have to, you know, someone might catch me in, a, in an inconsistency and I'm, you know, I have to somehow find a way around that. Um, and I think a lot of people do feel that stress when they're in an argument or when they're, like, defending something publicly. Um, and they maybe haven't consciously thought about an alternative, which is that you could just <laughs> allow yourself to, you know, change your mind when you notice new facts. And that's kind of lovely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Julia. I think, uh, you know, you wrote a wonderful book, but I want to read one bit in the book and maybe we can wrap it up this way. Uh -huh. You know, you write, leaning into confusion is about inverting the way you're used to seeing the world. Instead of dismissing observations that contradict your theories, get curious about them. Instead of writing people off as irrational when they don't behave the way you think they should, ask yourself why their behavior might be rational. 
instead of trying to fit confusing observations into your pre-existing theories treat them as clues to a new theory the, i mean that that's just uh, you know, i guess that's a that's what the masters might have right the old masters might have so <laughs> julia this was a wonderful book and i say this with uh, and i really mean this when i say this when i read this book i i, I immediately felt you know this was one of the bus- best books that i've read in a long time and oh. you know i've gone about you know really gifting these people a lot of people uh, copies of this book so once again on behalf of the charbak podcast and everybody who listens to this one uh, julia thanks a lot for writing this book that's so wonderful to hear thank you so much it was a pleasure speaking with you all right guys we'll wrap today's discussion up uh, when you watch it doesn't matter if you're going to be listening to this or i mean usually i say viewing this but obviously this is an audio only version uh-huh. uh, you can go to the description of the podcast uh, and in the description of the podcast will be the link to buy this book i insist when i say i insist i really insist each and every one of you should go and buy this book this <laughs> book will change your life it will change the way you think and i am not selling you soap uh, so please go and <laughs> go and read this book and please also support the charvak podcast go and follow julia on twitter and you can also listen to the rationally speaking uh, podcast uh, that uh, that she hosts uh, i'll see you guys next time please support the charvak podcast like uh, subscribe to the channel like the video and until then take care